Welcome to the Cosmos in You podcast, where we interview scientists, philosophers, and leading thinkers to discuss the nature of our reality and the impact it has on our daily lives. Hello, and welcome to the podcast, The Cosmos in You. It's great to have you here. If this is your first time, thanks for tuning in. And for all my returning listeners, hello, great to have you here as well. I'm actually just returned and getting over jet lag from being in Munich, Germany, where I was speaking at a conference on innovation. And the topic was courageous creator, how to create a vision and new possibilities. And I have to say so much of what I shared came from interviewing all these incredible minds that I have the privilege of interviewing on this podcast. And it was neat to share with a whole new audience. So that was really fun and exciting. And if you are looking to bring something like that into your organization, or if you are organizing an event, please feel free to contact me at susannascully.com as I love, love talking about this work and helping people to create a new vision and to be inspired and to step into the place of awe and wonder and get into the flow and and to influence others with their vision and really lead, uh, consciously lead others, which I think is really needed in the world today. And I love to help facil- facilitate that. So feel free to contact me and you can find out more about my talk on my website. Anyhow, so let's bring to today, I'm really, really thrilled. Such a fascinating conversation. You guys are going to love this. So today I have Bo Lato, who is a world-renowned neuroscientist who specializes in the biology and psychology of perception. He's originally from Seattle, Washington, and has lived in the UK for over 20 years. He received his undergraduate degree from UC Berkeley, his PhD from the University of Edinburgh Medical School, and was a fellow at Duke University. He's been conducting and presenting research on human perception and behavior for more than 25 years and has published over 60 publications and two academic books. As a professor of neuroscience at the University College London, his interest in education, business, and the arts has led him into entrepreneurship and engaging the public with science. He passionately believes in the impact perception research can have on people from all walks of life. And his new book, which is called Deviate, The Science of Seeing Differently, was just released. And it is incredible. It is so helpful to read both from a personal standpoint, but also from a professional standpoint, if you are looking in how to innovate in your own life or you're looking to innovate at your organization. This is a book you want to read. So in this episode, we discuss the three steps we must each take to open up ourselves to new possibilities, why pursuing conflict is crucial to our personal evolution, and that conflict is different than you think it is. So I thought this was really interesting. How to create the environment for those around us to live a creative and innovative life. And finally, the reason we search for certainty in our decisions and how it may not serve us as well as we think that it does. So without further ado, let's jump in. Welcome, Bo. Thanks so much for being here today. Thank you. It's really good to be here. Well, it's great to have you. And I, as I was mentioning in reading your book, Deviate, is just absolutely fascinating. And so what I'd love to do is have you start telling us about why you wrote this book and um, what inspired you and and what you hope readers to get out of it. Uh, Well, that's a big question. (laughs) You know, just that. Just that. (laughs) Well, tell us about the book. So so why did I write it? Um, uh, I wrote it because... I, I'm interested in, well, the reason why I wanted to write it is because I think that it's very important to create opportunities for people to have the possibility of seeing differently. Mm-hmm. And, and so much of what makes humans, uh, so wonderful is their ability to adapt. And adapting is, is the process of seeing differently. But if we really want to get people to see differently, or at least create that possibility, we have to understand the principles by which the brain perceives in the first place. 
What are the principles of seeing? And could we then apply those principles to see differently? So that's one of the reasons for writing it is to create that possibility, is to create that awareness about how this actually takes place. And I don't know how easy of an answer it is. I imagine it's not. But uh, what are the principles of seeing? What 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 do we think we know about seeing and are wrong about? Yeah. So more or less the basic assumption that almost all of us have, uh, at least behaviorally, uh, and to the extent that we've actually thought about it, is that we have an objective view of the world. And what deviate begins with is the idea that we don't. We don't see the world in an accurate, objective sense, which isn't to say that the world doesn't exist, right? This isn't postmodern relativism that says, you know, all perceptions are equivalent. No, um, there is a physical world, but the point is that we didn't evolve to see it in an accurate sense. What evolution, what empiricism, what experience gives us is the ability to see things usefully, not, and that's not the same thing as seeing it necessarily accurately. So it's the, it's the difference between useful and accurate. That's the key point. That's the key point. Because a lot of times when people, when you tell them, look, you don't see the world as it really is, that can feel incredibly disconcerting. It's like, whoa, then what do I hold on to? And what I want to suggest is the idea that by embracing that, by becoming aware of that and understanding the science behind it, it actually is incredibly freeing because it means you have the possibility of becoming part of the process of perception itself. You don't have to be necessarily an innocent bystander of your own perceptions. You can com- become the creator of your perceptions. Not all of them, because a lot of our perceptions, a lot of our assumptions that guide our perceptions, we inherit from our evolutionary ancestors and from our culture. But there are biases and assumptions that we can actually be in control of, which will alter how we perceive the world. So if I am in control of those biases or I do have an awareness, right, as you had, as you had said, how can I be in the world differently? What would it look like to um, walk in the world in that way? Yeah. So what's the awareness that it gives you? Well, and, and how does that matter in mm-hmm. terms of what you do? Uh, and the idea is that. What I want people to understand is, or maybe walk away with, is to know less at the end of the book than they think they know now. Hmm. That's not typical, I suppose, for a book. You usually want to have people sort of better informed. That's a good selling point, Bo. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) But I actually want them to know less. I want them to understand more, but know less. Because you could argue that so much of what is interesting begins with doubt. It begins with not knowing. It begins with a question. And I would, I want people to question their most, at the most basic level of whether or not they even see the world as it really is. Because if you have doubt at that level, and I don't mean doubt that, that stops you from stepping forward, but doubt that, in, that enables you to step forward. So a combination of doubt with courage. Because if you have doubt at that level, it means you have the possibility now to ask questions. Because without doubt, you're not going to ask a question. You're certain, right? Mm. But we only ask questions if we actually step into uncertainty. So there's tremendous power in celebrating doubt because doubt with courage has that possibility of enabling you to ask questions. And through asking questions, we discover. And you can actually discover yourself. And in doing so, you change how you might perceive things in the future. So let's take, uh, for example, let's imagine Sarah is listening to this podcast interview now. She's driving in her car, um, perhaps driving on the way home from work, yeah. going through all of the you know regular things, all the stress and you know a million things going on. Maybe she wants to accomplish something, but something's holding her back. How would she use this idea of doubt and uncertainty? To give me an example of what this would look like for her. Yeah, well, if, if Sarah was interested in seeing differently, mm-hmm. maybe Sarah wants to become and live more creatively mm-hmm. by having better awareness of that everything she's doing in the moment, every behavior, every perception is grounded in her assumptions and her biases. 
and not necessarily consciously, almost always unconsciously. Okay. And that those biases and assumptions come from a place. They come from history. And it's not a passive history. It's a history of having interacted with the world and may, how your brain makes meaning from that interaction. So what we see now and behave now is grounded in those assumptions and biases that we get from history. Now, by becoming aware of that, she's now taken the first step that enables her to now take the next steps, which is, well, we can accept we have those biases, but now she has to become aware of them. But so often, we're blind to the reasons why we do things. So she now can enter that process of discovering what her biases are and then questioning them. So, and in oh, questioning biases, we change what's possible. So, for example, Sarah, okay, so she, the end goal for her is living a more creative life. So the first thing she would do is become aware of the assumptions that she has. And those assumptions are mostly subconscious assumptions based on her personal history going all the way back to birth. Yes. And not just her personal history. There'll also be uh, the history of her culture. Mm. So she will have inherited a lot of her assumptions uh, and also even her an uh, evolutionary ancestral history. So we come into the world with all kinds of bias and assumptions. And these assumptions are essential. They keep us alive, right? Every time you're, you're, you take a step forward, your brain has all kinds of assumptions that the floor is not going to give way, that you're not stepping into a hole, that your leg's not going to give way, right? These assumptions are essential for our survival. It's just that our world also changes. So what was once useful may no longer be useful, which is why your brain evolved to adapt. The challenge is that to adapt, to see differently, means you have to go to a place which is where our brain almost always involved for us to avoid, which is to step into uncertainty. Mm. So, so that's I'm step two, where she starts to question her biases, which, which makes for uncertainty. Exactly. Okay. And once she actually knows what they are, and by the way, sometimes the best person to reveal your own biases and assumptions to you is not you. Mm. It's another person. And so once you can identify those biases, then you can question them. Right? It creates the possibility of questioning at least. And when you question and change, and in that process, change your biases, what happens is that your space of possibility, what you will do next, can change. Right? Because your space of possibility is determined by what your assumptions and biases mm, are. This is so good. So let's say, for example, I know a lot of people will have, uh, let's say a lot of people's parents grew up in the depression, right? Um, and so for survival, uh, an assumption or biases is that, you know, money is hard to come by or, um, you know, you have to stay the course, don't take too many risks, et cetera. I know this is a really common uh, assumption that current generation is struggling with because times are different now. Is that an example? Yeah, that'd be an example. And in fact, one of our most basic biases that we come into the world with is the fear of uncertainty, yeah. to avoid uncertainty. Yeah. In fact, almost so much of our behavior is an attempt to reduce uncertainty, uh, not to increase it. Okay. Uh, so you could argue that uh, that's one of the reasons why Uber is successful, is because what they do is they not only do they make it easier to order a taxi, but what they do is they decrease the uncertainty of when your taxi is going to arrive. Mm. If I put you on the street corner in New York, say, and ask you to get a taxi, hail down a taxi, right? And by the end of the five minutes, when the taxi arrives, often you can feel incredibly stressed because you're not sure when you're actually going to get that taxi. Your cortisol levels go up, etc. If instead I say, now stand on that corner for the same amount of time, also five minutes, and say, but don't worry, your taxi will be there in five minutes. <laughs> you're going to look on your phone. You're going to look around. You feel fine because you know when it's going to arrive because you have a decreased level of uncertainty. Right? So a lot of our behavior is about decreasing uncertainty, which is why we often try to create these environments that try to mitigate against uncertainty. We try to create predictable spaces. And that's one of the reasons why we have this health and safety gone mad. 
or why in schools and universities, I mean, imagine where people feel offended if I tell you something that's different from what you assume to be true already. People, these young people feel insulted by that. They feel that's an aggressive act, right? Why? Because suddenly you have to ask a question that challenges what you assume to be true already, especially if you identify with that. I'm not actually challenging you to who you are. That's a fundamental step into uncertainty. Mm. And yet the irony is only by going into uncertainty can you actually ever see differently. By only challenging your assumptions. And, and I don't want to say that the task is actually to transform from A to B. Far more interesting is to complexify. You would complexify your assumptions because you can never escape from them. You will always have assumptions and biases. That's how your brain works. But what you can do is you can complexify your space of possibility, which means you actually have more directions to move in at any point in time. Imagine a metaphorically, your, your, your assumptions are so constrained that you're on a line. You can only move in one direction, <laughs> right? Forward or backward. And now imagine that your space of possibility, your assumptions is a three dimensional space. Right? You have more assumptions, which means at any point in time, I can move now in three directions. Now imagine I have more and more and more. Now suddenly I can move in 16 directions at any point in time. So the point is not to step outside the box. This whole idea of, of, of stepping outside the box, I think, is, is completely wrong. What you want to do is complexify the shape. Because right? all you do if you step out of a box, you just step into another box. Mm -hmm. You're going from one third dimensional space into another. Right? It's a different box, but you're still constrained. What you really want to do is have it be a dodecahedron. <laughs> a what? <laughs> dimensional space, right? You actually just want to complexify your space, not step out of the box, because you never step out of the box. You always step into a new one. So what does this look like? Again, coming back to Sarah. Yeah. Poor <laughs> Sarah. I hope she hasn't crashed by now. <laughs> Sarah, stay with us here. She's like, <laughs> so, so Sarah's now questioning her biases and she's using somebody else to help question those biases, right? So she's done step two. Okay. While in the car, that's the passenger in the car. Exactly. <laughs> right. and, and by the way, she's probably using Waze, which is the she's app that tells her Waze. exactly how to go. So she feels that certainty. The passenger is using Waze and she's definitely not doing this on the phone. That's right. <laughs> Pay attention to the road, Sarah. Okay. Yep. So now she's done step two. She's questioned her biases. She's stepping into uncertainty. Now what? So she's stepping into her uncertainty. So it really depends on the environment in which she is existing, um, which will determine what she does next. Okay. If she's okay. in a space of competition, of fear, there's a chance when you step, where she steps into her uncertainty, she's going to feel tremendous risk. Uh, she'll feel, as a consequence, a lot of stress. Her cortisol levels will go up. Her brain cells will start dying. Her brain will become less plastic. She'll become a more extreme version of herself. If she's liberal, she'll become more liberal. If she's conservative, she'll become more conservative. Right? If, however, and that's typically what happens. Okay. Okay. And then what she'll do is she'll make a decision that decreases the uncertainty. She'll say, whoop, not going there. And she'll hold more firmly to her previous beliefs. In fact, her eye movements will change. She'll start looking for evidence that confirms what she assumes to be true already. It's called our cognitive biases. She'll look for um, behaviors that will decrease risk, that will minimize the chance of dying because dying is easy, mm -hmm. right? Living's what's hard. If, however, she steps into that space in a different way of being, where she's celebrating the uncertainty, she's celebrating the possibility, she is doing it because the doing of it provides its own reward. Now. She will enable herself to go to a new place. And I'll talk about what that way of being is that's required. But the point is that if you want to go from A to B, the first step to go from A to B is to go to not A. <laughs> right? Is to simply stop. Because if everything I'm doing right now is a reflex, and it's a reflexive meaning grounded in my history, my first step is simply to let go of that meaning, right? To go from A to not A. That is stepping into uncertainty, to not have a reflexive meaning attached to this stimulus. Now I can go in lots of directions. But the only way to do that 
is to do it in a way that evolution enabled us to do it, which is in the context of play. Mm. Play is that space where we love uncertainty. But what's more, if we add intention to play, that's actually science. What defines science is not, a, is not the scientific method. That's the craft of science, hugely important. But that's not what defines a good scientist or good science. Good science begins with a great question. But in order to ask a great question, you have to embrace and embody the idea that asking a great question is a great idea. And that way of being is effectively play with intention. And in fact, you could argue almost anything that is creative has that element of play with intention. Is a word that comes up for me when I hear you say play with intention, the word that comes up is a, is a sense of wonder. Yes. Is so we actually created a, what we call the I scientist program. Okay. We're playing with this idea. This is for, it's an education program. It's a science education program. We're working with kids, but not only kids where we're reframing science as play with intention. And by play with intention, I don't mean that science is fun and making it playful. I find, you know, that's nice. It recruits people, but it's not actually correct because to play well is hard. Ask an Olympic athlete, right? To do science well is in fact hard. It's not always playful. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't necessarily mean you're not engaged in the process of play with intention, which is that you're still asking questions and excited about the discovery and the reward is discovery itself. Right? And when we created that program, the first step is awe and wonder. Mm. And in fact, when someone starts my lab, I say, you know, why did you get up this morning? What do you care about? Because if you don't care, you're not going to ask a question. Right? And I don't care what they care about. I just want them to care. I want them to have that sense of awe and wonder. And once you have the awe and wonder, the next step is to ask the question, why? And then that's followed by what if? And then, of course, we have W's throughout. Then it's a wow, which is the observation. And then it's who cares? You share it with others. And that sharing becomes the awe and wonder for the next cycle. Hmm. That's effectively the scientific process. It's not the scientific method. It captures embedded in that the scientific process of, of empiricism. But in fact, your brain is inherently empirical. That's how it learns, by engaging with the world through the process of trial and error. But in order to do that, you have to want to. So bringing in this, um, this deviation, right, is, is the deviate what comes in between the being in fear versus being in uncertainty? Is that deviate? Is that, that's where you deviate? Yeah, to deviate is effectively to be yourself. Mm. That's kind of irony. Hmm. Right? Uh, and to discover why you are where you are. And then from that, you now have the choice to do something differently. Right. And the point is not necessarily to get people to go somewhere else because they might be quite happy where they are. It's about encouraging them to understand why they're there. It's the why that's particularly important where we tend to focus on the what, the where, the when. And these are information based, but they don't necessarily get into the why. So to deviate is, again, to better understand yourself. So, for instance, if you think about yourself in the context of other people, mm -hmm. let's say other women. Yep. Right. Now, there could be a Venn diagram, an overlap. And the bits that overlap are what define, in a sense, the average human, the average person, and the average woman. But what makes you you is the bit that deviates from that average. The bits that don't overlap. Mm -hmm. Right. So to love someone, ironically, is not to love their averageness. It's not to love their normalness. It's to love their deviance. Right. That's what defines who they are. And it's discovering that deviant part of you and enabling yourself then to challenge what you assume to be true already, to challenge your own assumptions. So to deviate doesn't mean you have to suddenly become an astronaut. Mm -hmm. We all have our own assumptions. We all have our own normal that we can explore. Right. And that could be an objectively big or small step. But for each person, it feels the same. Because for each person, they're pushing their own boundaries. 
And so when you are able to step into that place of deviation, and I love the example of the, of the Venn diagram, partly because I'm visual, but, um, so assuming you're going to come back to Sarah, Sarah's, she, she's awareness, has awareness of that part of the Venn diagram of where she deviates. Um, and she, you know, questions the assumptions that she has or biases that she has about being that, uh, that part of herself. Um, then all of these new possibilities open up to her because, uh, because yeah, all these yeah. blocks are removed. Yeah. Yeah, she's she's more complex. She's a more com- not complicated. She's more complex. It's, it's a very, very fundamental difference. What's the difference between complex and complicated? Uh, complex is the idea of interacting parts. So you can have uh, this complexity is very biological. It's very natural. To give you an example, uh, what defines life? are not the elements, but the interaction between the elements. Take, for instance, uh, something that's not living, but the, the idea of complexity, which is a whirlpool. Okay. The whirlpool is a function, a consequence of the interaction between the water molecules. You can't predict a, a whirlpool necessarily based on the study of an individual water molecule. The whirlpool exists in the space between. It exists in the interaction between them. Right? So the more complex, the more elements you have that are interacting, the more complex is your search space, the more possibility there is, the more directions that I can go to. And we know from complex systems theory that the more complex your search space, the more likely it is that the best solution exists in that space. If you have a really simple space of just, say, one assumption, well, it's easy to move along that, but it's not very likely to have a very good solution. There will be a best solution in that space, but it's not likely to be the best overall solution. Mm, got it. Right? So when we complexify, and we can complexify within ourselves, which really means becoming more open to possibility, right? Yeah. We can complexify within ourselves, but we can also complexify within groups. A company can complexify. Right by increasing diversity between people uh, with within the groups, the power of that is that each of those people brings together a different kind of set of assumptions. You put them together, and now you have a very complex set of assumptions. In fact, they're more likely to come up with a more creative solution than another group of people that, though on average they might have a higher average IQ, but they have they all come from the same background. They're less likely to come up with a great solution. They're very likely to be very efficient, but not so likely to be creative. And innovation is, in fact, the combination of those two. You actually need both. You want both creativity, but you also want efficiency. And what you really want is a movement between the two. And we can do that within ourselves. We can do that in our relationships with the people we love, with our, uh, but also within work. Right? So actually, when I talk to companies about this, which we often do, I want to talk to the people individually because you can't get the company to be innovative if the people themselves don't live more innovatively. And what is the process you take the individual through to assess that? Do you begin to break down those walls or what does that look like? Ultimately, they have to do it themselves, Uh um, but with the help of others, of course. Yeah. Um, In some sense, that's what therapies are. Yeah. Uh, um, in fact, that's where philosophy comes in, because philosophy is actually incredibly practical. The skill of philosophy is the ability to identify what your assumptions are and to question them. That's kind of the crap. That's one of the great things about philosophy. All kids should learn philosophy. All kids should learn that skill. We don't even teach kids much less how to ask a question, much less what a good question is. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And there's tremendous because because we teach them how to be efficient. And the best environment for efficiency to maximize efficiency is competition. We teach them that there are answers and the best ways to get to them, um, or the fastest ways at least to get to them. We teach kids how to be a sous chef, not a chef. Right? But really what we want is for kids to become adaptable. Why? Because increasingly our world is becoming more complex. The more interconnected, the more complex our world is, and the less predictable it becomes. 
So the most successful systems will be the most adaptable. We need the children to be adaptable. That means being able to move between creativity and efficiency. That means being able to embrace the possibility of being wrong, of asking questions, etc. And the only way that we can do that really is by having awareness by how the perceptual system actually works in the first place. That's how we construct our perceptions in the first place. Right? Yeah. Okay, so tell me about what this looks like. How do you apply this to your own life and your own work? So my own life, um, on the personal side, um, the really it's about conflict, um, which actually is relevant both to personal life but also work life, that it's really only through conflict that we can learn. Uh, mm. Conflict, but what I mean by conflict is to enter a space which is different from what you expect or maybe even want. Mm. And... At that point, we actually have the choice and the possibility of crossing that boundary and actually learning. But the problem is so much of our conflict is set up to win and not learn. So in conflict, I have to prove that you're wrong and to shift you towards me. And you're trying to do exactly the opposite. You're trying to prove that I'm wrong and to shift me towards you. The only direction I can move is towards you. So, but my, my aim is not to move at all, but to shift you towards me. So the conflict is set up to win and not learn. So what would happen if instead we entered conflict, and that's partly because we enter conflict with answers. We enter conflict with competition, uh, and we enter conflict with certainty. And what I'm trying to do in conflict is to increase my certainty, not decrease it. But if instead, and as soon as you understand how perception works, you need to enter conflict in a different way, which is enter conflict with doubt enter conflict with the ability to truly listen by letting go of your own assumptions of meaning and to truly try to understand the other person's meaning. You enter conflict with questions. You enter conflict with the aim to learn. And once that happens, now you have the possibility of expanding, complexifying your space of possibility. Because now my aim is not necessarily shift you towards me or me towards you, but for both of us to move away from where we are. Mm, it's this beginner's mind, right? This, what if everything I thought I knew was wrong? And if I stood in that stance, then what is possible? Yes. Mm. Which isn't to say that you are wrong. Right. Something, this again is not postmodern relativism. Some things are better than others. Mm -hmm. Right. But the aim is to create understanding. Right. So the person I'm with, I want to be able to understand, understand him or her. I might, at the end of it, still disagree, but I can never, I, it's so much more difficult to enter to, it's so much more difficult to create that understanding if I don't enter in the conflict with the intention of learning, with the intention of possibly being wrong, with the intention of respect. And that happens if I enter in with doubt, which is why I want people to know less at the end of the book than they think they know now. So they can actually create the possibility of freedom. It's all about freedom. I now have the freedom to possibly move away from where I am. Or in the very least, better understand why I am where I am. Mm. That's so beautiful. And I have to say, just hearing it is so incredibly inspiring and so uh, needed, I think, at a personal level. And then I think of even what's happening in our country right now. Absolutely. Right. Uh, this is so needed more I than ever. Yes. And so I try to apply this in my personal life. I fail all the time. Okay. <laughs> uh, but I try to enter conflict in that way. And in fact, in some senses, in, in certain contexts, it's super easy to enter conflict in that way. Because actually, for instance, in science, when I'm in conflict with the people with whom I'm collaborating, it's an incredibly positive experience. Because they're disagreeing, I'm disagreeing, I'm not trying to necessarily, of course, in some sense, I'm trying to um, we're trying to shift each other around, but we're, we're all trying to, what we're trying to do is move. Mm. We're trying to move from where we are in order to go to a place that none of us have actually predicted. Right now, of course, that's much harder when you have a huge amount at stake or you think you have a huge amount at stake. And what's more, um, what we're, what, w another way we actually create conflict, which you've actually seen in our more recent elections is that if I can be the source of your uncertainty, 
but also the only source by which I can relieve that uncertainty, that gives me a trend uh, that gives me a tremendous amount of ability to control you. Mm. And I see this in relationships all the time, where people will purposefully withhold information only to create uncertainty in the other person. Which creates fear. Which creates fear, which creates stress. And what's more, the person knows that you're the only one who can now relieve that uncertainty. So it's a way of controlling. Right? Now, of course, we can only provide clarity when we have clarity ourselves. But very often, people will purposely not reveal that clarity, partly because it might be challenging for themselves, but also it's a way of controlling. Um, another way is that if everything I'm doing and everything I'm seeing is a consequence of my history of meanings, then how is it possible that I can see differently? Well, what we do is we change what I call your future past. You change the meanings of the events that happened in the past. You can't change the events themselves. That's what every story is. It's about a re-meaning of the past. Therapies are about re-meaning the past. The significance of re-meaning the past is it becomes your future history. Mm. Which is what you will do and say and believe and feel in the future. So I can't. So everything you do right now becomes part of your future past. And with awareness, you can layer in a potential level of choice in what you do right now because your response is the meaning of the event. And what your brain will perceive in the future is the meaning of the event, not the event. And so often what people also do in terms of control is they'll try to re-mean your history right, mm -hmm. that you identify with in order to influence what you will then do in the future. One of the shortest lived genre of books is a history book. Right? Mm -hmm. We're constantly re-meaning the past because it alters what we'll do in the future. And that's incredibly positive. It can be. And like everything, it could also be used in a non-positive way. It's all the intention behind it. Yeah. And that can also be wonderful in loving relationships. But that's also where you get conflict and where people attach different meanings to the event. And so they project their meaning onto the other person. And the other person is, in fact, in their own mind, the, my perception of you is actually my own perception of meaning projected onto you. Yeah. yeah. Right? And that's all I ever have access to. But to understand someone is to understand their own meaning, their own why. And in doing so, that can also decrease the potential for negative conflict. Because there's no competition, there is no judgment, there is no, you know, need There can to still right. be judgment. Mm -hmm. There can still be judgment. It could be that I judge that's not something I want to be part of or that's not the kind of person I want to engage with. But I want to do that by truly knowing what it is I'm judging, if you see what I mean, as opposed to judging my own judgments of you. Got it. Okay. Because if who you are is simply my projection onto you, the anger I feel is the anger that I have towards that particular judgment. But that judgment doesn't necessarily even belong to you. It's me projecting it onto you. So I'm basically having an argument with myself. <laughs> right? And then you're debating with me because it's sort of like, no, wait a minute, that's not that's not um what I was feeling then. Right. <laughs> <laughs> because that's all we have access to is our own meanings based on our own history of what that information would have meant for us in the past. You know, whenever you look at a beautiful piece of art, you're projecting the meaning onto that art. Because it evokes some emotion or some experience or some meaning that is yeah. personal to us, yeah. Or to our culture mm -hmm. or to our evolutionary history. Right? In fact, a lot of our meanings and assumptions uh, come from others. You know, most of your life happens without you there, you could argue. So, coming back to Sarah, she's finishing oh, up her drive. Sarah. No, no, Sarah, don't forget about oh, Sarah here. <laughs> She's, she's finishing up her drive. If we were to leave her with parting thoughts of something, you know, as you said, I love when you said um, it's all about movement, right? Going from where you are now into this unknown space. 
obviously she needs to read the book because there's way, way more in here than, than we even had a chance to get into. But what are the parting words to her as she's about to embark on this journey into the unknown? Hmm. Well, one is that we can't step into the unknown unless we step from a place of known. Uh, you can't step into uncertainty unless you step from a place of certainty. Right? Otherwise, you're trying to step from water. You need to step from a place, something solid. And it's very important to, to know what that is. What is your why? What is the place that you don't want to question, at least for the moment, that enables you to step into a new place? That often comes from other people. That's a great teacher that creates a certainty for kids that enables them to then ask questions. That's a, a loving relationship, a partner, right? If to, to love my partner is that I provide her with enough sense of adoration and love and security that enables her to then ask questions and take risks whether or not I'm there. With my kids, you know, I want them to be in a place where they can make a mistake. Uh, they will own that mistake, but it, but it doesn't shatter them, doesn't destroy them, because they have that sense that they're asking that question. They feel comfortable about asking that question. You actually see this in, in young, young children, where they're just starting to explore the world, and they'll be with their mother or their father, and there's this, like, this invisible, uh, invisible tether. And actually, kids that come from a very insecure background that invisible tether can be incredibly short. They don't want to stray too far from the parent. Yeah. But for the kids who actually feel very secure, that invisible tether can be longer and longer and longer. In other words, we enable our children, we enable people we love in order to explore. Right? So one aim with Sarah is actually for her to create this possibility for others. Mm. We focus so much on ourselves, but our brain actually loves it gets more reward when we give to others and we have the possibility of enabling others to deviate mm. and so in some sense the whole point of deviate is not simply about getting yourself to see differently it's about the context and environment that enables you to create the possibility that others might feel to see differently and not necessarily in the direction you want them to mm. but to expand to become more open I love that. Thank you, Bo. This has been so uh, inspiring, insightful, and um, I can already, you know, just, I love the end shift is that all of a sudden it came to mind for my husband, my children, my clients, my, you know, everybody of how can I help uh, create the sense of possibility for them. So thank you for creating that in me and for in all of our listeners. Oh, well, thank you very much. That's lovely. All right. So thanks. And where can people find out more about the book Deviate and about you and Lab of Misfits? And Well, they can go on to the lab's website, which is labofmisfits.com. Okay. And as far as where they can get the book, they can get the book from the usual places and, and, uh, and, the, um, and where they can learn about me is basically that, that website and they can, you know, become a misfit and join the Lab of Misfits. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Bo. Okay. Thank Thanks. you. I hope you all enjoyed that episode as much as I did and would love to continue the conversation. So please feel free to reach out on our Facebook page, which is Susanna Scully, S-U-Z-A-N-N-A-H-S-C-U-L-L-Y. You can find us at the same Twitter handle, Susanna Scully, and also over at Instagram. And our website is SusannaScully.com. So keep it pretty simple there. Thank you all for listening in and look forward to chatting with you next time.